the the primary criminals of the world since World War II is the United States and then you know and NATO but but I, I just it, it just can't be not said I don't think NATO exists to invade Russia NATO exists to assert American hegemony in Europe NATO exists to make sure every European country is part of the American arms uh, weaponry system uh, NATO's there to make sure that Europe uh, never becomes uh, a capitalist power outside of the U.S. Uh, system. Uh, NATO's there to make sure there's never an alliance between Germany and Russia, which would become a kind of independent power in Europe that could rival, you know, a Europe led by a, a German-Russian alliance would would be of the same size of economy and, and population more or less of the United States. I mean, NATO's there to assert American hegemony in Europe. I think it's primary role. Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Lab. Today we have with us Paul J. Paul is a journalist and a filmmaker. He is the editor-in-chief and host of the Analysis.News, a video and audio current affairs interview and commentary show and website. His films have won numerous awards at major festivals around the world. Paul, welcome to India and Global Lab. Hi, thank you for the invitation. Okay, so before we jump into the more political questions, can you just give us a background of the kind of family you grew up in and the schools you went to and your background and what brought you to the work you do so that our viewers can understand your background better? Yeah, I guess. Um, so I grew up, uh, what do they call, red diaper baby. Uh, both my parents were uh, lefties, uh where my mother was acting in hollywood in late 1940s and my father was uh, getting trained as a union organizer in la although he's from montreal and uh they both left uh, the u.s during the mccarthy house and the house of un-american activities committee hearings and all that. They got out, I guess, before they could deport my father, which might have been coming, they thought it might. So they came back to Toronto. Uh, all that said, the McCarthyite atmosphere in Canada was much stronger than most people realize. Um, it wasn't as uh, widespread in terms of people getting fired and losing their jobs and being persecuted in front of hearings. It wasn't as exaggerated as in the US. But certainly people did lose their jobs. And there was a very organized campaign during that period to uh, purge the unions in Canada of the left. Uh, in fact, the CIA was very involved with a guy named Hal Banks who ran the Seafarers Union in Canada. And he helped organize a, a campaign to uh, squash the uh, communist-led union in INCO, which was the, uh, may still be the biggest nickel mine in the world um, and the, it was mine mill which was a left wing and communist led union uh, in Inco and Sudbury and my father worked for that union head when they came back to Canada he was a, a business so it was a period of uh, quite a bit of uh, anti-left anti-soviet anti-communist uh, propaganda we, we you know I grew up watching TV shows like I was a communist for the FBI you know there's the, the Cold War propaganda was very intense in Canada even if it wasn't as intense uh, you know we in school we would do exercises of uh covering our asses and hiding under our desks in case there was a nuclear 
war. Um, so all that said, my, my, there wasn't actually as much politics talked about in my house as one might think because of the atmosphere. But at any rate, I didn't grow up with a Cold War mentality. Uh, and there were, you know, issues were discussed in the news and, and stuff, you know. So it was, a, in, I would say, an intelligent household in terms of political conversation, but not so overtly left as one, you know, as maybe it could have been. Um, but, you know, I was very affected as soon as I was legally allowed at 16 years old, uh, because I couldn't imagine spending the last four or five years of my life in school, because I was sure the world would end before I was 20 years old, because Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, you know, the tension in terms of nuclear weapons. Uh, so, I mean, all that to be said, I was, you know, very shaped by the Cold War, but not part of it. Uh, you know, I'm lucky that I didn't grow up with Cold War mentality because it's pretty hard not to when you grow up in North America when I did. But, you know, I'm born in 1951. And, uh, but I wasn't that political, uh, but the Vietnam War got me engaged. And, and you know, it's a long story, but uh, I worked for years. I worked for five years as a carman mechanic on the railroad, fixing freight cars. I worked, I drove a truck at the post office for three, four years. And then I started making films when I hit around 30 years old. Um, anyway, this, is, it's long. this is in the 70s and the 80s? Yeah, I worked on the railroad in the, uh, I guess it would be the 70s. I worked in a punch press factory, then on the railroad on midnight shift for five years. Uh, post office was about three, four years. Yeah, And I started making films, I guess, in the early, around the, yeah, somewhere in the 80s. Yeah. What, what brought you to media and film? Because you clearly grew up in a film family or film uh, environment and what sort of brought you to do media work uh, also along with the film? Uh, a series of accidents, uh, no grand plan. Mm -hmm. I don't even think my family's, uh, you know, my uncle was a writer and I had different cousins that were acting and this and that. I don't think it had anything to do with it. Um, I, I went to an experiment once when I quit high school, I went to an experimental school and somebody donated a camera. And uh, 16, 16 millimeter. I'm bugged because of that. Um, and I didn't know what to do with myself. And so I figured, okay, I'll go to film school. So I got a letter from the school claiming I had finished high school, which wasn't really true, but I had the letter and I, I applied for the London School of Film Technique. Mm -hmm. And I was accepted. Uh, so I was going to go to England, go to film school. But they told me I was so young, I had to wait a year. So I was just turning 17 or 18, maybe, I guess 18. And most of the kids, in, or not kids, most of the people in the school were postgraduate. But I, they liked my little film. But I had a year to kill. And I wound up going to San Francisco and LA and, and the, the big anti-war demonstrations in Berkeley and and then I opened up a nonprofit record store and waiting to go to school. And as I was about to have to go to film school, uh, Pierre Trudeau declared the War Measures Act after there was the kidnapping of uh, the first a Quebec cabinet minister, first the high commissioner from England, and they let him go. And then they kidnapped and killed the Quebec cabinet minister, the Front de Liberation du Quebec, which is the uh, militant organization fighting for independence of Quebec from Canada. So I, I just couldn't imagine leaving my country in the midst of all that to go to film school. So that's when I started all the, these working class jobs, but eventually got back to filmmaking. And, and, and I, once I was in it, it was kind of just gravitated in that direction. Great. I guess this is, a, this is an excellent background, given we are going to discuss a lot of Cold War, Hot War, um, the security state, uh, and so on. So let me start with uh, with multilateralism. I mean, a lot is going on about de-dollarization, but it's not just that. 
a lot of experiments have been pushed through recently in the Middle East, um, in Latin America, new currency experiments and so on. We had Vijay Prashad and a whole range of people who are much more optimistic about the emerging multilateral world as opposed to the imperial uh, US-led unipolar, if you like, the imperial world order. And I was listening to you in the analysis.news and I felt that you have some substantive, um, shall I say, criticism or caution that you flagged um, against the emerging multilateral institutions or, or the multilateral world order. So can we just start with that? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I think let's back up one step. The, the, the issue of the unipolar world, I think, was highly exaggerated. Without doubt, global capitalism was managed by the United States. Um, no, without doubt, it was the uh, preeminent military economic power for, you know, certainly since the fall of the Soviet Union. But it's exaggerated, I think, how much they controlled the world. A lot of the world had its own ideas. A lot of countries had their own plans and ambitions. And the U.S. tried to manipulate the outcome of everything, but they often didn't succeed. I mean, how many wars did the United States win since World War II? Uh, you know, every major military incursion ended in a debacle, uh, except, you know, their great victory was what? Uh, Panama? where they, you know, they were able to overthrow Noriega. Oh, the, oh, I'm sorry, the other great glorious victory was over Granada. That was another big one, yeah. I mean, every major military incursion, in spite of the trillions of dollars and the, you know, what is it, a thousand or more military bases, uh, you know, dominant nuclear power, on and on, every major military incursion was a debacle. Um, now, I, the CIA and the financial blackmail and pressure the United States is able to put on countries was quite successful in some places, you know, the coup in Iran and, you know, there's other places where, where the covert activities uh, were, were, were fairly successful, you know, from an imperialist point of view. But this wasn't a world, ever a world, that was just completely dictated by the United States. In fact, the days of direct colonial rule uh, were more or less over in the 19th century. Uh, you know, Britain came to the uh, conclusion, there's a famous quote about Canada from a, a guy named Lord Durham, I believe his name was. He said, it says, the, the colonies are a boat anchor around our neck. Uh, the cost of, of direct colonial rule, and you'll know from India, it's way better to have neo-colonialism. It's way better to have local uh, ruling elites uh, who have their own interest, who collaborate with the uh, external power. But when you do that, they also have their own interests. And in some countries, those local elites are not puppets. Uh, and in fact, a lot of the places, you know, even the South Vietnamese who were really uh, puppet to a large extent, they didn't always do what they were told. And sometimes people like Noriega in Panama get out of control. So it's a very chaotic world. And the um, uh, even in the unipolar world, the Americans struggled to try to make it in their image and likeness and, and, and to their desires and, and often, often failed. Because there's another force in history, even if the uh, local oligarchs of Asia, Africa, and Latin America, the, the, the ruling elites, even if they're compliant, in many, any, maybe most cases, the peoples of these countries are not so compliant. You know, people have been asking this, uh, raising this thing, oh, what if, what would the United States do if Mexico accepted Chinese or Russian weapons? Wouldn't they march into Mexico the way the Russians did? Well, I don't know if they would, because the Mexican people would fight back. Like, why didn't the United States invade Venezuela when Russia was sending arms, landing military planes in Venezuela's airport? Who knows what else 
uh, in theory, Russia may have put in Venezuela. They didn't invade Venezuela. Why? Because they're afraid of the Venezuelan people. That's why. They would be such bogged down in a war against the, the, the whole Venezuelan people. Even sections of the opposition would have joined into a fight. So there's another force in history. So let's not just talk about unipolar world because it suggests this all-powerful United States. No, the peoples of the world, especially when they stand up and fight, they have power too. And, and the, even in the United States, you know, the elites you know, would love to control the outcome of everything, but look at the bloody chaos in the United States. They can't even control what's going on in their own country. Capitalism, capitalism is in chaos. Uh, and, and part of that, chaos, the decline of the U.S. dominant order uh, is the, the rise of, of course, China. And now they have a competing big power. Um, so the question comes, is the competing big power and its allies in theory, the, you know, these BRIC countries, um, is that a countervailing force to U.S. power? That seems to be the thesis. And the answer is sometimes, other times, no. I mean, certainly Brazil under Bolsonaro couldn't have been more collaborative with the United States, even though China is Brazil's main trading partner. Mm -hmm. uh, the Indian elites play a, you know, the same game that's been played for a long time, you know, play different powers off against each other, which means they also have their own interests. They don't just do what they're told. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the Indian, uh, Indian capital isn't completely enmeshed in Western capitalism, uh, for that matter, so is China. Uh, it's, th these are complicated relationships. So the BRICS are, on the whole, led by elites who have the same kind of interests as the American elites, but they're playing it from their own national interests. Sometimes that will be a good thing. Like, there's a debate over whether China's loans to uh, Asia, Africa, and Latin America are predatory or not. Well, you, you know, people like Patrick Bond and others argue they can be quite predatory. Um, others, Jayadi Ghosh says, well, they're not nearly as bad as what the West does. I think both things can be true. Uh, the, the, is, is, it, is it a positive? that countries, especially, you know, take Latin America, have an alternative uh, for financing. Of course it is. If they can say to the Americans, look, we don't, we're not going to accept your terms. We can go to the Chinese. Well, that's got to be a positive that people at least have that flexibility. On the other hand, to think that the BRICS under are really some kind of anti-imperialist force, I think is an illusion. And you know, depending on the circumstances, they, they will still side with the Americans when it's in their interest or under certain kinds of pressure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so there, is, there seems to be two things at play here. One is at the, at the realm of international relations, and then there is a bottom-up view from the national countries themselves. So there, I guess, I mean, take, say, a country like India or Brazil, if not under Lula, if under Bolsonaro. So these are very repressive societies, uh, you know, not just in terms of neoliberalism, but also right-wing forces, not now in Brazil, but erstwhile. So there is a problem in, in that, that it is, um, it is not as simple to be very hopeful about these, these um, institutions like BRICS, for instance. But then there is, a dimension of international relations where the credit market initially was completely dominated by uh, Western foreign institutions, um, pension funds, mutual funds, and so on, but also multilateral, so-called multilateral, but unilateral institutions like the World Banks or the IMFs, and even for that matter, Asian development banks. So, there, there, there seems to be these two things. So there, there, there can be a skepticism about BRICS or for that matter, these alternative arrangements um, 
looking from the prism of their own national economies. But isn't it a step forward when we look at it from the from the prism of international relations where a few institutions have either to dominate it? We'll see. Um, I, you know, if we were to see another American style invasion of Iraq somewhere or another, mm -hmm. uh, we'll see to what extent they actually stand up. If they do, it would obviously be positive. Um, in terms of giving countries some alternatives and financing, yes, it's a positive. Um, is it going to stop uh, U.S. aggression somewhere? Highly doubt it. Uh, haven't seen it. Um, and from time to time, I mean, these are not on the whole progressive people. I think Lula, you know, could say is in the progressive camp. So now Brazil is led by uh, someone who's relatively progressive. What he is able to actually do, we'll see. You know, dealing with the, the you know half, you know, was it two thirds of the country support severe uh, abortion regulation, which means two thirds of the country is very religious. Um, so it's not just he has to deal with a military that w would like to see him gone and an oligarchy that would like to see him gone. It's actually uh, large parts of the population are quite conservative. Uh, so we'll see what he can do. Um, the, uh, but if you're saying, you know, is there something positive in, in this kind of BRICS alliance it can have it has the potential to push back on some issues when it does great i think the position of the brics countries so far uh well first of all russia's included in that and there's nothing progressive about russia uh, it's 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 oligarchy uh and inst and state institutions are every bit uh as aggressive and bankrupt of more any uh, legitimacy moral legitimacy say as the united states uh, the only difference is the United States has committed far more war crimes and has a far more powerful global presence. Uh, but I'm sure, I mean, let's put it this way. This is the character of monopoly capitalism. If Canada could be the global hegemon, they would jump at it. You know, I'm sitting in Toronto right now. Uh, you know, if Canada, if history had played out differently and it was Canada you know, maybe if they'd won the war of 1812 and taken over. I mean, this, this is the nature of monopoly capitalism is to seek monopoly. That's why it's called monopoly capitalism. And that means monopoly everywhere, every place that's possible. But when you're a Canada, you can only play a junior partner. So that's what the role they play. And, and, and the BRIC countries, most of them have been junior partners. And, and, may, and may well do again. It just depends on the situation. India, you know, plays this dual role. You know, they, they'll take, buy a sub from the West. They'll buy arms from, from Russia. And, you know, in, in a way that may be good, but there's nothing progressive about Modi. Mm -hmm. um, but let's, let's really back up this whole conversation just a step. Because on what criteria are we judging all these things? And I think... We, we have to say, what is the fundamental problem facing us humans? And then start looking at everything. So obviously, the climate crisis and the danger risk of nuclear war. You got to judge everything from that. So if you're going to judge is BRICS good or bad, you got to judge it from the point of view of climate, and the threat of nuclear war. Well, certainly Russia's invasion of Ukraine has made the world far more dangerous. That's not to say that the uh, refusal of the United States to clearly state Ukraine will never be in NATO wasn't a provocation. Of course it was. The Ukrainian government could have said, we know we're not getting into NATO in any known horizon because the germans and french had made it clear that they oh yes we'll recognize the aspiration but it was clear the germans and french were not going to say yes to ukraine and nato um, the russian invasion the ukraine war has made the ability to have any kind of international negotiation on climate almost impossible 
to the threat of using tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine by Russia has made the world far more dangerous. And the American refusal to find compromise by taking NATO off the table, linking arms uh, exports to Ukraine to negotiations and compromise, and focus the world on the climate crisis and uh, nuclear arms reduction. I mean, it, that everything has to be judged from that. So, you know, what is, are the BRICS countries? Is this multipolar world getting us closer to arms reduction, nuclear arms reduction treaties? Because there's nothing now. There's not a single treaty that's actually meaningful right now. Uh, and, and next year, there won't even be new start will be over. They've all, the Americans are the worst to blame without question. They are, you know, the, seven, the abrogation of the uh, ABM treaty and so on. But we're heading into a world w with virtually no arms reduction treaties event or, mm -hmm. um, and no international climate negotiations that mean anything. And, you know, they meet, you know, COP meets every so often and has a bunch of wind goes back and forth. Um, as, as the scientific predictions get increasingly dire. So I don't see the point of discussing anything going on in the world unless you start from the climate crisis, the threat of nuclear war. So, so the, the multilateralism, I think the jury's out right now on whether it's meaningful. I mean, of course, multilateralism is better than unilateralism, okay. Mm -hmm. But specifically, whether the BRICS countries together are going to move us closer towards dealing with climate crisis and dealing with a reduction of nuclear arms, certainly Russia ain't going to help in that direction. Uh, China, maybe. I mean, China has the potential. We'll see if they start, if they're serious about reducing the coal. Uh, yeah, you know, what is it? A, a new coal-fired energy thing, or four or five open up every week. They say it's transitional. We'll see. So I just—it's uh, not a cut and dried thing, yes or no to BRICS, but it's certainly not some great anti-imperialist force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess what it seems to me, listening to you as well, that there there seems to be different areas where for instance in the in in, in the area of military mil, militarism BRICS doesn't seem to be an alternative at all like india and china themselves are in the arms race um or you know um, R russia is and we'll come to that so 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 that's that's a place where it doesn't look very optimistic one can talk about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but how functional that is, uh, one can debate, one can argue. And on the other hand, there are areas where it it definitely shows some potential, like one of the major crises that emerging economies are facing is the sovereign debt crisis. And that sovereign debt crisis is very majorly about these institutional lenders. And for that, we need a sort of multilateral credit agreement where obviously the PRC would be a big player in it, but it should be multilateral and it should it should check this private uh, profiteers and rentiers power and there there may be greater hope and so on. Just to wrap this segment up and enter uh, the war in Ukraine, I just wanted to quickly ask you, what do you think about China leading um, the struggle against climate change, particularly given it is said that China is capable of producing um, alternative green technologies at a scale and also at a price which can be affordable to much of the world. One hopes out of their own nationalist interests, they're not a fossil fuel producer. So they've got no real interest in not developing sustainable energy. Um, if you look at the, uh, you know, you look at a map of what the world looks like at three degrees, at four degrees, where we are headed, uh, there's not a hell of a lot of livable China left. Mm 
you know, much of, I, I think at four degrees, one map I saw is something like two thirds of China, there's no agriculture left. You know, so that's within what could be 75 years, 80 years, mm -hmm. uh, could be less. Every time there's a estimate comes out, it turns out things are going faster than we thought. So th there's, you know, the, the issue of the climate crisis is the predominant issue facing humanity and nuclear weapons. But the climate crisis is less than a decade. We're going to be at 1.5. And, and many, many scientists think if you hit one five, you can't stop from getting from two and so on. Mm -hmm. um, I don't understand why China isn't more out there. I mean, it, what needs to be done is so damn obvious and it ties to Ukraine. You know, the US and China should offer a Marshall Plan to Russia to get off fossil fuel production. I mean, it's, you know, beyond imagining given today's politics. But on the other hand, if you work back from how do we stop this from happening, I don't know what else there is. Uh, and, and, and unfortunately, China now has a source of even cheaper fossil fuel energy because the Russians are selling them all this stuff at a discount, which puts less pressure on China to move to sustainable. So, it, I hope China takes a lead. I, I, you know, I, I, whether China is socialist or not, I tend to think it's more like China is a capitalist country with socialist characteristics. Mm -hmm. uh, but whatever, the label doesn't matter too much at this point. Will will China lead the way? I don't think they're doing it effectively now. And instead of uh, soft selling this Russian invasion into Ukraine and using it for their own geostrategic purposes, because there's no apologizing uh, for what is essentially uh, a war of aggression against Ukraine. This is an illegal, unjust war against Ukraine, period. There was no imminent threat to Russia, period. Doesn't mean all the provocations and everything else from the Americans and the Europeans, they should be included, don't matter. They're a factor. But there was no imminent threat. China knows that, and they won't come out and say it. And in, instead of leading the way on Ukraine, give, you know, let, you know, they're starting to make noises in that direction. But China maybe could maneuver an, a quote unquote honorable way out for uh, Putin's government. Um, and make the whole emphasis on climate. Uh, and But so far, no. So far, they're playing a, a pretty conventionally uh, capitalist kind of foreign policy. Like, don't get embroiled in this, but take advantage of it. And, you know, a socialist foreign policy would be solidarity with the workers of Ukraine and people, solidarity with the workers and people of Russia, and, and do everything to stop the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of people. And they're not out front doing that. It's all a little cat and mouse, and especially given climate. We don't have time for that. Your critique would say that China has been trying to come up with plans um, to get out of the war. It has already presented multiple proposals. Chinese ministers have traveled to both Ukraine and Russia and have been trying to negotiate something out of it. And on the other hand, to ignore the fact that the West, NATO, and a whole range of others that includes formations like the AUKUS had just ganged up against China. Under such circumstances, how much realistic is it for China to directly denounce Russia? Oh, I don't even care if they directly denounce Russia or not. I, I don't care if it's done through backroom channels. China, for its own interests and the interests of the people of the world, should find a way to end the war and put the focus on climate crisis. And listen, uh, the, the primary criminals of the world since World War II 
is the United States and then, you know, and NATO. But but I, I just it, it just can't be not said. I don't think NATO exists to invade Russia. NATO exists to assert American hegemony in Europe. NATO exists to make sure every European country is part of the American arms uh, weaponry system. Uh, NATO's there to make sure that Europe uh, never becomes a, a capitalist power outside of the US uh, system. Uh, NATO's there to make sure there's never an alliance between Germany and Russia which would become a kind of independent power in Europe that could rival, you know, a Europe led by a, a German-Russian alliance would, would be of the same size of economy and, and population, more or less, of the United States. I mean, NATO's there to assert American hegemony in Europe. I think it's primary role. And the European elites go along with it because they, they cash in on the American gravy train. You know, all the Europeans make money out of the arms industry. Uh, they, they make money out of the uh, exploitation of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. The, you know, they're part of the American banking system and so on and so on. So, but it's not a threat to invade Russia. The, you know, NATO was already in Estonia. It's closer to Moscow than any place in Ukraine. They didn't bombard Moscow just because Estonia is in NATO. Uh, the, the real threat to Russia uh, is is not whether Ukraine's in NATO and and not even honest Dan Ellsberg says it wouldn't change anything even if there were nuclear weapons in Ukraine it's no different than having them in in Estonia or Poland or Romania uh, the real threat is American submarines that can take out the virtually every major city in Russia within minutes and there's nothing you know Ukraine's got nothing to do with it um, the uh, So, so, so is, is China a solution to this? At the level of big powers, it's the only possible one. Now, that doesn't mean the peoples of countries don't have agency. Um, it's not just up, you know, our history isn't going to just be decided, I hope, by the ruling circles of these countries. Um, I guess what I'm saying is in terms of big power, the only one that for its own interest, not because it has some great socialist vision or something, whether they do or don't, but even in capitalist terms, there's a reason why China can and should play this role. So if China can help negotiate an end to Ukraine, I hope they do it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And the Ukrainians need to compromise and the Americans are absolutely at least certainly since the invasion and 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 provocatively in the lead up to but not as much I think as people say but the Americans no doubt see this they see this as a proxy war but I think it's wrong to call it a proxy war even though the Russians want to call it a proxy war the Americans call it a proxy war but to discount the Ukrainian people's resistance to invasion that's BS. It's like calling the Vietnamese war a proxy war. Why, why, why is Ukraine's resistance to Russian invasion more a proxy war than Vietnam was? I mean, why did the U.S. invade Vietnam? I mean, it wasn't because they gave that much a damn about Vietnam. It was because the Soviet Union and China. It was, it was a pro For the Americans, Vietnam was a proxy war, but it sure wasn't for the Vietnamese. They fought their own war. It was a national liberation war. So but it's... just just to press a little bit on this point, I mean, one can say that what what Ukraine is for Russia, not just in terms of physical proximity, but also Ukraine is very critical to Russia's access to fresh water. Ukraine has a substantial part of Russian speaking minority population. Ukraine is just at the back door of, and, and then there is a presence of NATO. All of these things don't qualify at all to Vietnam. A, the U.S. is not at the door of Vietnam physically. There is There was no NATO-like Soviet-backed um, you know, military alliance, although on paper you can say there was Warsaw Pact, but there was nothing like what the NATO is. 
And there is nothing like American minorities in Vietnam. So what would be your response to that? Well, I'm dealing, I'm not saying there's some exact equivalent. I'm saying that you could have, if you use this logic, that this is just the standoff between Russia and the United States or Russia and NATO, and you discount the Ukrainian people's struggle against an invader. At that level, you could have said that about Vietnam because the Americans weren't in Vietnam because of the Vietnamese. They were there because they didn't want to see the influence of socialism as they saw it from Russia and China spreading through Asia. So for the Americans, it was a proxy war. For the Vietnamese, it wasn't a proxy war. Uh, other than that, uh, there's all, all kinds of differences between the two things. But, but what's similar is that there's a war of aggression and the Ukrainian people are fighting against it. The Ukrainian oligarchs are, part, you know, to a large extent, to blame for all this. I mean, Zelensky could have said, no to NATO prior to the invasion. He could have taken NATO off the table, even if the uh, Americans wouldn't. And there were a lot of voices in Ukraine, you know, calling on him to do that. I, mean, I know, in the, you know, in the weeks leading up to the invasion, uh, a lot of academics in Ukraine came out very publicly calling on Zelensky to declare uh, Ukraine will never be part of NATO. I don't know whether that would have stopped the invasion or not, but it certainly would have taken that rationale off the table um so so the, the issue of the agency of the peoples uh, including the ukrainian people it can't be discounted and people have a right to resist uh an invasion that doesn't mean and now i'll tell you the biggest difference between the vietnamese and the ukrainian situation i think is that who was leading the struggle mm -hmm. right you now in ukraine the struggle is being led by the oligarchy and 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 I, you know i've said to some of the ukrainian left-wingers i've uh, i've interviewed i said you know i hope a day comes when the russians leave and you turn your guns on the ukrainian oligarchy you know turn this into like you know what the soviets did in the first world war uh, you know, you, you're all armed, you're all trained. Uh, why, why shed so much blood just to hand Ukraine back to the Ukrainian oligarchy? And, and maybe we'll see something like that. I, I, I don't know. Uh, but, but, but back up again. The, the need to end this war now comes from the fundamental issue of facing the climate crisis and the threat of nuclear war. Um, you know, some Ukrainians say, you know, and Americans are saying, we shouldn't submit to Russian blackmail on nuclear. Oh, when someone has a gun to your head, sometimes you do submit. Mm -hmm. um, and, and especially so when, when, like, let's say, oh, no, we won't compromise the Ukrainian oligarch, or Zelensky saying, we won't, we're going to free all of Ukraine, Crimea and Donbass. Lugansk and Donetsk and uh, and I and I've said to the some of the left wing Ukrainian Ukrainians I've interviewed wh why why are you going to shed so much blood to hand industrial Eastern Ukraine back to Western Ukrainian oligarchs or Eastern Ukrainian oligarchs that are but they're more pro Russian uh, why why are you shedding all this blood I mean what is the point of sovereignty. I mean, what is this bullshit about sovereignty? It only matters to stop interference in your internal affairs. Okay, there it matters. But to shed so much blood so that the oligarchs can take back control of Eastern Ukraine? And is life, honestly, is life going to be that much different under Russian oligarchs or Ukrainian oligarchs? Maybe a little. I mean, people do have a right to choose their oligarchs. The Ukrainian people have a right to say, okay, we'd rather the Ukrainian oligarchs than the Russian oligarchs. So we'd rather predatory Western European finance capital over predatory Russian finance capital. I mean, people have a right to choose that without getting invaded. Uh, R Russia should have, if they were actually driven by legitimate national security concerns, and I think they weren't, I think it was secondary to their nationalist narrative, but they should have done everything like what they did in 2014. 
you know, they offered a better economic package than the West did in 2014, which is what led one of the factors that led to the, the coup in 2014. Um, even, you know, Lavrov actually said if there'd been a legitimate election six months later, which is what was talked about, the pro-Russian guy would have lost. But they didn't wait. And, and the, sure, the Americans played a role in it. But they should have done everything to persuade people, especially in eastern Ukraine, how much life would be better under in Russia. But if you talk to people like Boris Kargalitsky, who actually you know, went to Donbass in 2014, supported the uh, independence of Do Lugansk and Donetsk. And he even at one point said, this seems almost like it's a new Paris commune because it was the left that was leading it. Boris says that you know, it was the left unions and left activists that became the leadership that didn't want to live under this right-wing Ukrainian government in 2014. But he says under the Russian government, this is the resistance movement to the Don Donbas war after after the right wing came to power in Ukraine. Yeah, the, the, they established that first they asked for a kind of federal uh, state like Quebec and Canada, an autonomous kind of status, right to language and, and you know, a certain amount of autonomy. Um, and and they were fighting for independence, but not in the initial stages, according to Boris and others. It was also not just a language or ethnic issue. It was also a, a substance of politics. They didn't like this right wing economics and rule of the Ukrainian oligarchy that came you know, to power in 2014. So it was really it had a progressive, even uh, Boris says, yeah, socialistic character. But he said uh, the Russian government under Putin got rid of these people. And, and he says, you know, within a few years, the left lost its power in Donbass. So he's like now totally in support of the Ukrainian opposition to the invasion. And he, he says he doesn't believe at all uh, either that there was a, a, a real threat. You know, some, one of the things coined is that uh, there was a genocidal threat against uh, the autonomous areas in Donbass and the Russians came in to save the day. But not only Boris says that's not true, the, the actual uh, OSCE uh, reportage on what was happening along the demarcation line in late 21 and early 2022, uh, there's absolutely no evidence that there was some big Ukrainian attack on Donbass planned. And, and this number 14,000 gets people killed. I mean, it's nonsense. Go look at the OSC reports. Uh, I mean, I can, if you want, I can get into more detail on that number. but. The OSCE, there's nothing in the OSC reports that suggests there was a, an imminent attack on Donbass. It, doesn't that report say 14,000, like 6,600 uh, on the Eastern Ukraine, like R Russian side, uh, 4,400 deaths um, of Ukrainian military and some 3,000 civilians? So isn't that the number, right? Yeah, it's roughly that. But the, the critical thing about it, there's two parts. One is almost all the deaths took place between 2014 and 2016, 17. Oh, between, yeah. yeah, when there really was a war going on. Um, and in that period, you know, I would put most of the blame on the Ukrainian government. Mm -hmm. They did not have to wage a war against Donbass. Uh, you know, they had, there were ways to have a legitimate referendum. There were ways to deal, they could have accepted the federal system. And then, you know, when the Minsk agreements were negotiated, they could have actually lived up to them, which the Ukrainian government and oligarchs did not. There's plenty of blame to put here on the Ukrainian elites side of all this, plenty. Uh, but if you look at the OSC report from 2018 to the end of 2021, it was something like a total of 310 killed. Like there were more people killed in car accidents. In 2021, the number of deaths was 10. So let me get rid of this sound here. Uh, there, you know, there was no doubt more people killed by car accidents in, in, in the autonomous areas uh, than 10 deaths uh, as a as a result of fighting. And then in the in the period that led up right up to the invasion, 
in the early months of 2022 in January and the beginning of February, um, there's no doubt there's a, a, a report of a big increase in shelling, but the shelling's going back and forth. And there's the only civilian death I can find in the OSC report, and if someone else can find something else, please tell me, one death, but on the Ukrainian and the site of where the Ukrainian government controlled. And then there was a school blown up, again, on the Ukrainian government controlled side. Now, there's certainly shells falling in the autonomous independent side, but mostly along the demarcation line. They have this map where all the shelling's going. So there's lots of the increase in shelling. It was going back and forth. But to keep throwing around this 14,000 figure, when what you said is correct, many of the 14,000 were actually Ukrainian government troops, I think over 3,000. And it, it was all mostly all over by 2018. But there's a, propag a pro-Russian propaganda machine that's hammering this stuff in social media. And it doesn't matter how many times you actually tell people to go look at the OSCE reports, or I, I've published them several times. It just, you know, some people just keep repeating the same stuff. So there seems to be two things that, that, that divides the left. One is the internal dynamics of Ukraine. And I guess there, your argument seems to be more plausible to me at least that you know countries do take right-wing turn almost fascism in case of ukraine i can see that happening in india all the time but that doesn't mean that you know there would be an external entity that would just go and you know try to resolve those things because forget about the right to do that or not most often it turns into a catastrophe i mean I, for instance, say that there is a strong case to be made about Kashmiri independence from India, but I would be very reluctant to say that I would support a Pakistani invasion into Kashmir because I know that would lead to a catastrophe. So I guess there, on that ground, the justification of denazifying Eastern Ukraine through a special military operation seems to be weak. But I want to just for a last moment return to the question of NATO because there are. Can, not... I, can I just jump in on Please. that last point? Just yeah. to... There's no doubt there was this Nazi, neo Nazi element in Ukraine, you know, the Azov Battalion. But before the invasion, they were not a dominant force in Ukrainian politics. I've been told by everyone that knows the situation, I think, that I trust. They were there, they had, they had influence, but the Ukrainian people elected this Jewish guy, Zelensky, and they elected him on a program which included a peaceful resolution with Donbass. That's what, was one of his platforms. Now, I don't think he lived up to it. And I think the far right was one of the reasons he didn't live up to it. But nothing has strengthened the far right in Ukraine more than the invasion has. Nothing has more Nazified Ukraine than the invasion has. And, and, and if you want to denazify, how about you start with your own country, Mr. President Putin? Because whether they call themselves overtly Nazis or not, this toxic mix of Russian nationalism and religion, which you can find in Putin's party, in, in the Orthodox Church, in the so-called Communist Party, this this is very little and uh, the anti-semitism that's profound in that the, the racism that's part of that uh the the ultra russian greater russian nationalism you know what other than calling themselves nazis what what exactly is the difference between in the ideology i'm not so sure so denazify russia and let the ukrainian people denazify ukraine but it's the same thing. What strengthened Nazis and the right wing in Ukraine more? The invasion. What strengthened NATO more? The invasion. I mean, NATO's never been so militarized, unified. You know, every supposed objective of this invasion has achieved the opposite. Yeah, on that ground, it's a it's it's a massive failure that NATO has got more strengthened and more members in the European Union have joined them. 
so-called neutral countries were never neutral, by the way, because they were sending, exporting arms uh, through NATO, uh, uh, including Switzerland and many of the Nordic countries. They have become uh, now de facto NATO members. So that's right. On I have a minor quibbling about the Nazis, like fascism thing, but maybe, or maybe you can quickly do away with that. I would say nationalism is is everywhere and i mean we don't like it and there is you know i didn't say all nationalism is fascist yeah nationalism right. in russia that's articulated and embodied by putin the orthodox church the communist party leadership not there's many people in the russian communist party should not be included in this the, the communist move party and has there's many sub parties in Russia it's it's a complicated mix and many of them are opposed to the invasion but the leadership that toxic mix mix I'm not sure ideologically what's so different than than the German the Nazi but and it doesn't matter it's it's a form to me it's a form of fascism one way or the other I'm not saying all nationalism is that yeah, I, I would say like one of the major differences in my reading of history and politics of fascism is the presence of organized groups that maintain some sort of autonomy from the state. Now, we know that the state is never neutral, but these are the brown shirts and the RSS in India or the Azov Battalion on the right sector in Ukraine, um, or you can say the Ku Klux Klan. And, you know, th th those are the kind of groups whose very widespread presence would lead to substantive form of fascism and there i'm not entirely sure and maybe paul why i'm asking you this question is because i i'm a little bit reluctant about throwing the word fascism everywhere like i hear people saying oh the chinese are fascists I, I don't see that. Like I, 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 can, I don't. I don't. No, see. you're not saying. No, you're not saying. You are saying. You you see that tendency. In no, I, I think. I think the Mussolini model mm -hmm. is more applicable than the Hitlerite model. Mm -hmm. uh, although you know, and there's some differences that matter. But uh, no, I, I I I think fascism is a stage of parasitical monopoly capitalism. It doesn't exist in all countries. Uh, it, uh, it comes at times of crises. Uh, and I think the crises in Russia was a, a, a rising discontent with the Russian oligarchs. I mean, we're not the only ones that see all these bloody yachts and see the way the oligarchs live. Um, the fundamental problem facing the Russian oligarchy is not Ukraine, it's the Russian people. And it's pretty old story to use nationalism and religion to kind of distract people from who the real problem is. Uh, so, I mean, Hitler used the Jews and here it's the Ukrainian Nazis. I mean, you can dress it up any way you want. Um, I mean, I, I, whether, I, I mean, I don't think fascism is some mystical demonic force. And the Americans have been, although domestically, on the whole, uh, have not fascists haven't won in the United States, although they've tried. Although, frankly, you know, I lived in Baltimore for seven, eight years, and if you're black and poor in downtown Baltimore, uh, you're living in you know pretty close to a police state. Um, but on the whole, but the U.S. obviously has supported. Like, what are the Saudis? I mean, I would call the Saudis fascists, the mon monaco fascists. I mean. I don't think the word has to be used or 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 be afraid of. I don't know, but I, I agree it does get thrown around sometimes too much. All right, so we don't have a lot of time. I'm just trying to rationalize the, the rest of the questions. I'm still tempted to spend one more question on this issue, like if you can address that, which is obviously you have done, but just to to, to point an argument that I see within the left. And that that is the argument that seems more convincing to me than the internal fascism argument is that there, there, there is evidence that 
just prior to the in, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was significant evidence that that NATO was almost pushed into the Russian throat. Like, and so so the argument. What's the evidence? Oh, I guess there was. Like, what's the evidence that anything had really changed? You know, since Buc the Bucharest thing, and what was that, 2008, when the Rush the Germans and French said they would not accept Ukraine into NATO. I even saw I, I even saw a Chinese article in Global Times, which is more or less, you know, an outlet. But for also, also Mirashimer makes this point that there were internal talks uh, once Biden came to power that they were pushing through inclusion of Ukraine into NATO, in which Russia was very, very direct right from the beginning, and which sort of makes a distinction between Russia's position vis-a-vis -vis some of the Eastern European nations' inclusion into NATO and Ukraine. So it is said that while Russia didn't like that, but they were very, very clear on Ukraine that we are, we are not going to be tolerating this. And and that that's the kind of thing that's said. Yeah, I know it's said, but I don't think there's any evidence there was any change in Ukraine's status vis-a-vis -vis NATO. Yes, there was this uh, American ambition, although it was mostly from Bush, but Biden has picked up a lot of that kind of foreign policy. <coughs> uh, but I don't see that anything qualitatively changed from 2021 to 2022. Ukraine was not on the verge or imminently about to join NATO, number one. Number two, even if it was, it's not grounds for invasion of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Makes no difference. There's only one thing, imminent threat to Russia. And like I said, there's already NATO states on the border or near, and they're not imminent threats to invade or attack Russia. So, so it doesn't matter even if. Now, that doesn't mean it's not a provocation. That, but it, but the fundamental thing at stake is not the threat to Russia's national security. It's the threat to Russia's sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's the assertion that every former Soviet republic that they possibly can is going to be incorporated into West, Western capitalism, into Western Europe. It's, it's the EU. Yes, that's a threat to Russian assertion of their spheres of influence. And as a big, not massive, but middle-sized really capitalist power with a massive military, at least nuclear, uh, it's a threat in terms of that sphere of influence. And, but are we as progressive people going to say that a big power has the right to defend a sphere of influence by slaughtering civilians? Mm -hmm. You know, we're on the side of the Ukrainian people. You know, it's not up to us with these inter-imperialist rivalries, inter-capitalist rivalries. It's not up to us to side with one over the other, especially when it comes to war. You know, yes, I would side with the Russian argument prior to the invasion. Mm -hmm. Ukraine should never join NATO. I would go further. Abolish NATO. I think I'm in Canada. I'm a dual citizen, but as a Canadian, I advocate get the hell out of NATO. You know, NATO advocates a first strike of nuclear weapons. So as Canada, we're implicated in this damn first strike policy. We're, we're up to our eyeballs in NORAD with a new $40 billion investment by Canadians in new uh, ABM, essentially anti-ballistic missile technology and, and you know, which is extremely dangerous. You know, there is no rationale for NATO to exist. Yes, there can be, you know, individual security arrangements and such. Okay, but that's none of that is an imminent threat. It's an imminent threat to Russia's influence in Ukraine. That was the imminent threat, not an imminent threat to Russian national sovereignty or to its people. And that's the only justification. For, for war. Fair enough. That's that that makes sense. Um, so hey, we, let me, let me, can I just back up one more sentence? Yes. Sure. We must look at this from the point of view that we're in a class society. And most of the discourse on Ukraine just forgets that we live in class society. And we're looking at this just through the prism 
a big power politics, geopolitics, this block versus that block. But our fundamental allegiance as progressives is to the peoples of these countries and support their struggle against their own oligarchs. And we should do, have our own struggle against our oligarchs. 